Hey folks, and thank you for joining us for another Rocket Matter webinar. My name is Nefer McDonald. I am the Business Development and Strategic Partnership Coordinator. Here at Rocket Matter, we are a cloud-based legal practice management software. Today, we're gonna be talking about going paperless, specifically how to get to a paperless law office in 2018. Uh, Rocket Matter does this webinar every winter um, and uh, we're really delighted to have all of you here today. And we're also very delighted to have esteemed panelists, um, Dennis Dimka and Ivy Gray. So Dennis is the founder and CEO of Uptime Legal, Legal Systems, which is North America's leading provider of technology, cloud, and marketing services to law firms. He started Uptime as a general practice IT service provider in 2005. Over Uptime's first decade, Dennis grew Uptime from a geographic generalist to a national specialist, honing uh, Uptime Legal's focus to nationwide cloud services to law firms. Dennis is also an author, and uh, he was an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and 2016 finalist. So great to have you here, Dennis. And uh, Ivy is the author of American Legal Style for Perfect It, which is a proofreading and editing program for lawyers that runs inside of Microsoft Word. It adds polish, reduces frustration, and saves non-billable time. She believes that part of going paperless starts with using less paper, which can be done by reducing rounds of editing hard copies. Perfect It helps with that. Uh, Ivy is also a paperless lawyer herself, which we're really excited about because you get firsthand knowledge from someone that's done this. And she recently published a white paper on paperless naming conventions. And Ivy is also a practicing lawyer. She's a senior lawyer at Griffin Hammerski. All right, folks, so let's get started. We're going to talk about why you should go paperless, paperless environment steps, the cloud, paperless naming conventions, and other paperless tools and technology. So let's kick it off with Dennis. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, and thank all of you for, for joining today. Um, going paperless uh, and just generally leveraging technology to make your practice more efficient and make your hopefully your life easier and better is very near and dear to my heart. So I'm excited to jump in and talk a little bit about going paperless. Um, and before we dig in really on the how, how to go paperless, I think it's a good idea to explore a little bit why, right? Why it's a good idea. Um, there are definitely a lot of benefits to go paperless, but in all of the law firms that I work with and talk to, and these are clients, prospective clients, colleagues, I'll always ask, you know, what, what for you is the driving uh, force? What's, what's the thing that's prompting you to go paperless? And I hear a lot of different answers, but here are really what I think are kind of the top seven based on, on the feedback that I hear. Next slide, please. So reason number one of why you should go paperless is organization and efficiency. Uh, hard copy documents, uh, as we all know, are difficult to keep organized, right? They, they tend to be spread over multiple file cabinets, multiple boxes at different locations, which among other problems, makes them not very quickly and easily retrievable. That makes them time consuming to find the particular document you're looking for. And it definitely lends uh, itself uh, to having documents be lost or misfiled. Uh, as opposed to a paperless system, a paperless law office, uh, a good paperless system, and I'll talk a little bit about systems later, uh, but a good paperless system will enforce a uniform organization across the whole firm. Um, and by that I mean it will enforce the storing and management of documents in a, in a, in a way that makes sense to your firm, so presumably in a matter-centric way. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, a paperless system will also maintain consist consistency in filing and categorization. Whether you need to create one section within a matter saying, hey, here's our, here are all the discovery documents. Or perhaps you want to be able to tag documents as this is a pleading, this is a motion, this is an order. Um, whatever, whatever you decide as a firm that you want to be done, a good paperless system will really help maintain that. And um, relating to organization and efficiency is uh, making documents, uh, making finding documents quick and easy which dovetails really well into what I view as reason number two, why going paperless should seriously be on your law firm's roadmap. Search, uh, search is important. Searching, and I, I put that term in quotes, hard copy files is slow and full of human error. 
right? I mean, it, it's, you could almost say you can't really search paper files. Uh, whereas with a paperless law firm, you can search across every document in your entire law firm's library, right? Every document that you've ever received, ever produced, um, you can search through every page of every document and you can search within older versions of a document. Perhaps what you're looking for is no longer in the current version of a document, but it did exist, say, three iterations ago. So that's important. So again, you can search across tens of thousands of pages um, and you can find any document in a number of ways with, with again, with the right system. Um, perhaps you need to find a very, uh, you're looking for a document that has a very specific piece of language in it. You can do that. Or perhaps you want a broader search. You wanna say, show me every uh, motion for amended findings we've ever done. You can do that when you're paperless and with the right system. So when I'm talking to law firms and trying to hopefully convince them to go paperless or, or when I sort of tell a story to try to illustrate what life could be like, sometimes what I'll say is, imagine being able to search across all of your law firm's documents, perhaps email notes and other content as quickly and as accurately as you do a Google search. That is exactly what you can have when you go paperless. And it's such a big reason. Uh, and bonus, uh, with the right system, uh, you can search across documents and email uh, uh, and other types of content within your firm um, with the right system. Um, because an email, well, we may not think of it as a document. It is, in effect, just another type of document. So with the right system, you can search beyond even just documents. Reason number three why you should seriously consider going paperless. Mobility. Uh, we know that the practice of law is an increasingly mobile profession. So going paperless will give your firm the ability to work really anytime, anywhere on any device. Um, and think about the different places that you either work today or maybe would like to work but can't or would like to work more effectively. Um, when you're paperless, you'll be able to do that uh, depending on how you go about it. You'll be able to work from home, the office, the courthouse, at a client site while traveling and hopefully have the same access to the same documents uh, that you would when you're in the office. And really, with, without a paperless law firm, working in these other areas requires you to know really in advance what documents you're gonna need and then physically take them with you, right? And hopefully you didn't forget anything and hopefully you remember to grab it. It's just an uh, inefficient and ineffective way to work. So reason number four, security and disaster recovery. Um, hard copy or paper files are vulnerable to threats, right, um, being destroyed. And there's the obvious ones, right, the big uh, headline grabbing disasters that could affect or destroy your documents, like things that show up on the news, right, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, those kinds of things, and, and they're serious. Um, but just as damaging and just as dangerous are less headline grabbing, but just as real are things, what I'll call localized disasters, smaller uh, localized problems or disasters like a fire, a flood, damage to the building, a burst pipe, a theft even. Um, if you only have hard copy documents, you're just, you're, you're very uh, susceptible to those kinds of threats. And I personally talked to clients uh, or, or law firms that later became clients here at Uptime Legal, where that's what they were coming from, right? They had had, either they were affected by a recent hurricane or there was a, a fire in their building and they lost a lot. And it's just not, uh, I mean, you can hear the anxiety in their voice. I mean, it's, it's a bad, they're having a bad day. So that's what, that's the kind of day, hopefully, that going paperless can help you avoid. Going paperless with the right system definitely provides the safety and security so that even if your entire office is destroyed, your client documents are safe and secure. And better yet, if you leverage the cloud to go paperless, your data will be stored in a highly redundant data center, um, you know, compared to just your office. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how the cloud can and probably should be your ally in your paperless journey in a little bit. So reason number five, why going paperless will make your life better. Sharing and collaboration. Um, going paperless, obviously will centralize your firm's documents, right? Because it puts all of your documents and data in one single central place, which then makes them easily shared with a whole host of other parties that you may need to share them with. Members of your firm, obviously. Remote offices, if you have satellite or branch offices or employees who work from home. Or other attorneys that you work with, of counsel attorneys, that kind of thing. Um, whereas, of course, uh, paper-only documents really 
prohibit or at the very least make it very difficult and cumbersome to share those documents outside of your physical office. So sharing and collaboration. Reason number six, um, why you should go paperless to a degree, your clients expect it, right? I mean, today, if you put yourself in your own client's shoes, a client is gonna expect that their attorney will be able to quickly pull up documents that they've sent to you, share and send documents to other parties as necessary quickly, uh, have access to all of the information relating to their case or their matter handy, even if you're not in the office. And maybe most importantly, they, they definitely have an expectation that you will safely store and protect their confidential information or their potentially confidential information. And if you're not able to meet these expectations, chances are your clients are likely to get the sense that your firm is behind the times. So your clients expect it. So I saved the best for last, I think. Um, going paperless will definitely save you time and money. Um, number one, you'll save a ton of time looking for retrieving uh, hard copy documents, things that, again, perhaps were misfiled, which means that less staff can really do the same job. And hopefully that translates to freeing up your, time, uh, your team's time for other projects, billable work, that sort of thing. Two, physical storage costs money. Um, whether your law office is in Midtown Manhattan or not, all of those bankers boxes and cabinets eat up square footage in your office space, uh, arguably unnecessarily. And three, you'll, you'll avoid those costly mistakes uh, of losing or misfiling documents when they're safely and securely stored electronically and no longer subject to those, those disasters and those threats that I just talked about. All right, Dennis, so thank you for are, that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and launch a quick poll here. Um, and we want to know what your biggest reason is for going paperless. And while you guys answer that, I do want to encourage you to put your questions in the questions widget for us. We'll take some time to get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, we're going to close the poll here in a couple of seconds. But we do want to find out you know, why you're here and what, what's motivating you to make this jump. Alrighty, so we're gonna close the poll here. All right, so 57% of you said getting organized is the biggest reason why you wanna go paperless, uh, followed closely by the ability to search documents, saving time and money, disaster recovery, increased security, sharing collaboration, and then saving space. All right, Dennis, so do you wanna tell us how to get here? Absolutely. I. Um... I don't know. I'm not quite sure why, but I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that organization was uh, the number one, probably because I'm OCD. But um, it's yeah, it's you know, you can always when you whenever you walk into a law firm or work with a law firm or any business for that matter that isn't organized, uh, including but not uh, not exclusively their documents, uh, you can tell. And I, and I think that's great that people are thinking about that. So with that said, um, how to go paperless in five relatively easy steps. So really at the hub of any law firm that is paperless is some sort of document management system, which is a type of software. Um, if a law firm is paperless, they either have a document management system or document management software, or they have a practice management system that has document management capabilities. And there's some overlap in what that means, but they have one or the other. And it is an important, uh, the reason it's, uh, it's really the first one that I'll talk through is because it is the most important one. Um, and a document management system isn't the only tool we'll use to go paperless, but it really does live at the epicenter of your paperless law firm. So what is that? What is a document management system or what does that mean for a law firm? Um, I sometimes describe a DMS as it's sometimes called, uh, we in technology love our, our acronyms, um, is really the digital hub of your paperless law firm. And I like to describe it as serving two big picture roles relating to your documents. Uh, your DMS will be, number one, it will be the warehouse for your documents, meaning it will store your documents and other content. Your, your files will live in the system. But a good DMS is more than just storage, right? It's more than just a place to put things. It's also an engine for your documents. And by that, I mean, it gives you and your users tools to make documents findable, make them relevant, make them useful. And a big important part of 
finding the right document management system and implementing it in the correct way is matter centricity. And what I mean by that is the, the ability and the practice of storing documents and other content, emails, et cetera, by matter. Um, within matter centricity, uh, and, and as important, is the ability to enforce structure and organization, uh, kind of like I alluded to a little earlier. So I'll, I'll, com I'll contrast that briefly to suppose you have Dropbox, and I'm not picking on Dropbox, but suppose you have Dropbox, or suppose you have the G drive or the S drive, and maybe some of you have a system like that. And perhaps you have within that drive a folder per client or per matter, and that's your kind of makeshift document management system. What I've seen without fail, time and time again, no matter how good and diligent you are on the outset of, of setting up a framework of folders that makes sense and works for you, as you add more staff, more cases, and more documents to that system, it will fall apart. You really need some kind of document management system to enforce that structure and keep things organized. Um, and that, that former scenario that I just described, we sometimes call the Wild West of folders. Um, and it's important that all documents, email, and other content are all stored together within a matter so that you can, in your document management or practice management software, open up a matter and see all of the documents that are important, all of the emails that are important, all of the notes and other content that are important and that relate to that matter in one place, all together. So step one, again, implement a document management system. It's the most important step. So two is integrate scanners and facts. And this is, in my view, sort of an extension of the implemented document management. Um, so if you haven't already, you'll certainly want to implement scanners firm-wide. Make sure everybody has access and is trained on how to use the scanners in your office. That could be a central big multifunction like, like a big Kyocera or Konica Minolta, uh, or it could be a personal individual scanner like the Fujitsu ScanSnap is very popular amongst law firms or some combination of the two. Either is fine, the important thing is to make sure that everybody has ready access to it. Um, if you want you know, full adoption of your new paperless endeavors uh, within everyone in your firm, you're gonna wanna make sure that everybody has easy access to a scanner. Um, similar but separate is to implement electronic fax. Um, what that does, a, a fax machine or, or service, uh, that provides electronic faxing or internet faxing it's sometimes called and what that does is it immediately turns inbound faxes into electronic documents usually pdfs and you can do that either with your your multifunction in some cases like so a lot of the kia Seras and conic minerals will do that uh, or um, possibly even better is just simply subscribe to a, an internet fax service so probably the most known one of those is going to be efax which you probably have heard of Another one is Max Email. Um, we, we at Uptime Legal actually use Max Email and it's great. And it's really simple. For a very low cost, you get a local fax number and every fax sent to that fax number comes in via, uh, as a PDF via either email or better yet, directly into your DMS, directly into your document management system. So that's step two, integrate scanners and fax. Step three. It's important to create, define, and document your paperless process. And within that, I think most important probably is your document intake process. So just like you have some level of process um, for intaking new clients or matters, you have, whether you realize it or not, you have a process for document intake. And it's important to understand that and document it so everybody in your firm is on the same page. Uh, and your, your policy or your process for that doesn't have to be elaborate or, or complex. It can be as simple as this example here. Um, so in this example, we took three different ways that a document could come into your firm, right? And then we define the process for each method. So for instance, you know, when you think about the different ways documents can come into your firm and into your practice, one is, of course, incoming physical documents such as by mail or by FedEx or what have you. So what would the process be? Well, you would scan it, you would save it into your DMS, and you would file it under the matter. Similarly, if an electronic document comes in, what's the process? Well, let's save it or take it from the fax or the email. Bonus, if your faxes are already coming in to your DMS, save it to the DMS and again, file it under the matter. And really, again, similar process for when you're creating a new document from scratch. Create the document, save it to the DMS, file it under the matter. And while this may seem almost overkill to, to document it 
uh, in this way. It really just helps visualize the process and make sure everybody in your team knows the process, knows your firm's requirements, and, and can follow it. So, you've implemented a DMS, you've integrated printers and scanners and fax, you've defined your policy. Uh, next step is to train your team. Um, so now that you have your, your new written policy, train every, everyone on how to follow the policy, how to use the systems, the scanners, the hardware, the software, everything. And I think it's really important, and sometimes this is missed, is to educate them not just on the what and how, but on the why. Um, you can get a lot of buy-in by sharing, hey, look, this is going to make your life easier. This is going to make your job easier. Here are the reasons we've decided to make Going Paperless a serious initiative for this firm. Um, and whether you, your reasons for doing it are some of the ones I shared earlier or your own, that's fine, but share that with them, right? It really does help with buy-in. I think another important point uh, as you're training uh, your team is to keep that policy simple, right? So it's easy to follow. With respect to the part of training that is related to systems, meaning the document management or practice management system, a good document management system is inherently intuitive, so training is inherently easier. And in our view, uh, a good document management software provider uh, will include good initial training and ongoing support. So if the provider of your document management solution can provide the training, that takes a pretty big load off your shoulders. So definitely leverage that if you have the ability. So finally, the last step. Everything's in place, your, tr your team is on board, excited and trained. Next, it's time to backfill documents. Um, and really, I think it's easy to break that into two categories, uh, electronic and paper documents. So backfilling, um, meaning, and by backfill, I mean going forward now at this point, everything new will follow your process and will automatically be paperless, be electronic, and be part of your document management system. But what about historical documents? Well. In the case of electronic historical documents, kind of like training, a good provider of document management software will do the migration or sometimes called the ingestion of your old documents into the system. Um, whether it be on a file server or in Google Drive or 10 places, right? They'll have a process by which they can reach out, wrap their arms around all the documents and ingest them into the DMS and organize them properly, right? So knowing that these files go to this matter, so on and so forth. Paper documents. Um, paper documents, unfortunately, you guys, there's no magic wand for uh, or easy button. Um, it is a manual process of scanning every document, OCRing it, saving it to the DMS, and filing it under the matter. So in, in effect, that same process you saw before, just a whole lot of times. It's manual, it's not fun, but it is necessary. Um, so advice I always give is have the whole firm chip in, especially since it's a lot of manual work. Have everybody chip in. A late night with some pizza and some coffee uh, never hurts to help get that done. Uh, and if it seems overwhelming, if you have a ton of paper or electronic documents, for that matter, to, to backfill, break it into manageable chunks. Don't let it overwhelm you to the point that you say, uh, we'll do this in 2019. Um, you know, start with open matters and then maybe move to recent matters uh, and, and go from there. It's better to break it up and, and do it over the course of six months or even longer than to not do it at all, right? So that is how to go paperless in five easy steps. One of the last things I wanna talk a little bit about is how the cloud is your ally or really the cloud should be your ally in your paperless journey. So we'll talk about the benefits of the cloud as it relates to, to going paperless. Um, paperless, as, as I've hopefully convinced you, is the best way to manage your law firm. And in almost every case, the cloud is the best way to go paperless. Uh, it's true, you could buy an on-site server. You could implement on-premise document management software and run it on your own environment. Um, but a, a cloud-based solution is going to be better than that. And here are kind of the six reasons that a cloud-based system, uh, apples to apples, uh, is, is better than an on-premise system. A cloud-based system, say a cloud-based, in this case, we're talking document management system, but I could say the same for other categories of software, cloud-based practice management system, is gonna be more reliable, right, than uh, software running on a single server in your law firm in the copy room or the co-closet. Uh, a cloud-based system is going to be more secure, uh, generally. Uh, 
the, the provider or the hoster of these cloud applications spend a lot of time and money making their environment secure, right? They're in the business of providing a cloud-based system, so security is part of that job description. Whereas for you as a law firm, it's not, right? You're not in the business necessarily of that, and you have better things to do. Uh, three, as I've already talked about a little bit, a cloud-based system is inherently um, accessible from anywhere. Um, yes, with an on-premise environment, you can set up some remote access tools. Um, a lot of times they're clunky and they don't work well. So um, by being in a cloud-based system, your system uh, will be and your documents will be more accessible. The cloud compared to, again, on-premise is more scalable. When you need to add employees, you just add employees. When you need to add space or add storage or add documents, you just do it. Um, and there's usually some price model that scales with it in a way that makes sense, uh, as opposed to on-premise where you have to periodically add servers, replace servers, upgrade servers. It's difficult to predict and it's always a headache. Five, cloud-based solutions tend to be easier to implement. Um, traditionally, not exclusively, but traditionally, premise-based software, including uh, document management software, requires a specialized consultant. So not only do you have to buy the software, you have to hire a special consultant to implement it into your practice. Cloud-based software usually has more of a uh, jump in and go sort of uh, way about them. So they're easier to implement. And last but not least, uh, generally speaking, cloud solutions tend to be more economical. You're not having to, again, buy servers, hire consultants, uh, replace servers, deal with IT challenges and headaches that ultimately cost you money, right? Cloud-based solutions usually have a very simple, fixed, flat, transparent pricing model, whether it be per user, per gig, whatever the case is, but you know exactly what it'll be. So that's it. That's really how to go paperless, why you should be thinking of going paperless, and why you should really consider leveraging the cloud to do that. All right, Dennis, thank you so much for that. That was great. Uh, it's really nice to be able to see, you know, some of the pain points that going paperless can actually soothe a little bit. So thank you for that great presentation. Um, so we had a question come in about how to decide which documents um, you need to name in a certain way. Like what's the best way to name documents so that you can search for them more effectively? And oh, you're so lucky because Ivy is about to take over and she's going to talk about developing your own file naming conventions. So Ivy, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thanks, Nefra. And thank you for uh, that lead up, Dennis. So I agree that you really should be using your own DMS, but sometimes with firms, if you're trying to get them to go paperless, you have to demonstrate that people will be on board and that your efforts will work before you spend the money. And so I like to think about file naming conventions as the fast, free first step in really getting your firm on board to be a paperless office. So it's an easy way to get started it's, uh, it's a plan that you can make and implement. You don't have to buy anything and it truly helps. In my practice, most of my paper comes from documents that I create. There are lots of file types out there, but I personally use Microsoft Word the most as, as an attorney. Uh, so I'll focus on Microsoft Word documents here, but the naming rules apply to all documents and they must be used uniformly. So before we get started, let's get the lay of the land. Uh, Nefra, can we have the first slide? So, what is a naming convention? Naming conventions are rules for naming the individual documents and files that you create, receive, or store. And why should you start here? Well, as you can see from the slide, uniform naming allows fast and reliable file retrieval. That's something that Dennis talked about. It immediately benefits workflow. It provides a strong foundation for next level paperless efforts. Now, all of those things are really great, but it doesn't work unless you have buy-in. If you work with others, getting buy-in is key. If people don't believe in your goals, they're unlikely to follow your rules, and a protocol that no one follows is useless. So the primary benefits of implementing a naming convention include enhancing productivity through digital workflows when all client documents, notes, and files are stored and connected to each other digitally, leveraging firm knowledge and experience by facilitating reliable and quick access to precedent documents and forms, Reducing non billable time wasted searching for precedent documents and forms before drafting a project can start. Serving as a backup and protecting the firm's documents and information so it can be retrieved in the event of a disaster. Secondary benefits include facilitating collaboration by allowing others to have access to your work in an organized and easily understandable manner. 
improving client service and responsiveness to calls because client documents and files can be quickly accessed and opened on a computer or a mobile device without having to track down the physical paper and file folder. Facilitating tra uh, transfers of clients, files, and information necessary for succession planning or the sale or merger of a firm business. And improving uniformity and promoting the firm's style and brand through consistency. Let's have the next slide, Nefra. Okay, so we want to get started, but I'm not going to tell you that it has to be done only one way or that my way is the only way. Just like dieting, everyone has their own approach. Trying to do something that just doesn't work for you or make sense to you is destined to fail. Now, imagine trying to go on that infamous grapefruit diet when you hate grapefruit, it just won't work. So my goal today is to guide you through developing your own protocols. There are no hard or fast rules and it's all very flexible. So your scheme depends on your practice and your firm. Your structure must be uniform and names must be unique. Flexible rules allow for custom design. Design reflects how you think about your documents and customized solutions encourage broad adoption and strict adherence. So think back to your last drafting assignment where you knew that your firm had successfully done that type of work before and you wanted to avoid reinventing the wheel. Perhaps you spent 30 minutes hunting for the precedent document before you could really get started. Or maybe you communicated your need to another lawyer or support staff and they searched too. That's a lot of time to waste looking for a document. Plus, that time's not billable. There is a better way. By implementing naming conventions and uniform file structures across the firm, you can avoid this frustration and wasted time. Consistent, uniform, universal naming conventions work, regardless of whether you're using an expensive document management system or a simple shared drive. Let's have that next slide, Nefra. But as Dennis cautioned you, I also want to caution you against trying to do too much. It's easy to get really excited and create a super complex system that you'll never use. So be honest from the beginning about how you work and how you think and what your team will buy into doing. All encompassing schemes are unwieldy. Overly strict schemes discourage adoption and adherence to the scheme. Overuse of abbreviations and acronyms can lead to unintelligible alphabet soup that makes it hard to find anything. Excessively reducing or limiting information can also make it hard to find, an information, uh, to find a document. The key is to develop a scheme that you'll use. It should be logical. You should be able to look at the file and tell what the logic is so that you, or anyone working with you, knows what to do when you come across something that you inevitably didn't address. Order the elements in a file name in the most helpful and logical way to retrieve the document. So let's talk about creating your plan. When creating the plan, you must pause for a moment to assess how you really work and think about how your firm really works. These are the questions to ask yourself. What types of workflows exist in your firm? Who are your clients? Do you have lots of them, a few of them, and you do lots of work for a few clients? What types of work do you do? Do you have litigation documents and transactional documents? How many folders and subfolders will you consistently use? How many acronyms and abbreviations will you remember? and consistently use. Also think about who creates your documents. Is it all of the secretaries, every attorney? Who's really responsible for that? How much uniformity or variation is part of each matter? Do you work from precedent documents? Do you work on Macs and PCs in your firm? So now let's think about the minimum elements that go into your plan. You have a date element. Uh, and always lead with the four digit year, followed by the month and day. The reason that uh, you should have a four digit year is that by using it that way, the documents from the 2000s really do show up after the documents from the 1990s. If you, uh, if you don't use a four digit year, that ends up in reverse. So you can group everything by year and then by month and then by day. You should also have a document type element that tells you what you're looking at. For instance, a motion for summary judgment, a memo, a letter, an asset purchase agreement, or a lease. Anything that makes sense to you is what you should be using, but it should be short and it should be uniform. A description element. It should tell you what the document's contents or purpose is. Your version control element. 
Just face it, you will have multiple versions, so plan for it. Lead with a zero so that they stay in order once you get to more than nine versions. And I know some of you may be thinking, whoever gets to more than nine versions, but when we collaborate, it happens all of the time. So law firms usually also add a few additional items. Uh, Nefer, let's have the next slide. Oh, I thought we had minimum element, uh, standard editions for law firms in there. Uh, so we'll just stop for a moment. Uh, the standard editions for law firms are that we have a from, by, and for element. That's the document author and the client name. There's usually a to element, which includes the intended recipient or counterparty. There's the disposition element, which is usually some sort of suffix that indicates whether the document was filed or sent. Uh, now, if you're including a client name, make sure that it's short and recognizable and will be used consistently. For businesses, use the shortest version of their name or business initials, unless a standard three to five digit acronym exists, such as a stock ticker symbol uh, for that specific entity. For individuals, state the family or last name first, followed by the first initial of the first name. The family name is a standard reference for record retrieval. And stating the family name first facilitates sorting in alphabetical order. Otherwise, you'll have everything with Mike listed together, even though you might have 20 Mikes as clients. All right, now let's look at tips for success. So as you're making decisions and getting really excited about all of the possibilities of going paperless, I want to take a moment to caution you. Remember that our goal isn't to exercise the most control over the people or the things in your firm. We want the benefits of having a naming convention. That's better, faster access to your precedent documents so that you can avoid reinventing the wheel. So that you can benefit from the work that your firm has done before, uh, before by finding old research memos, documents, and templates. So that you can save time by reusing documents and finding what you want to work on faster. So the tips for success. Keep file names short but meaningful. Really, names shouldn't be too long. I suggest that you don't exceed 64 characters for file names. Even that might be too much, but once you have all of the elements, they do get kind of long. Use abbreviations to limit file name length, but don't prioritize brevity over clarity. Abbreviations should help create concise file names that are easy to read and understand. This ties into some limits with uh, computer names or computer systems. Uh, and I know a lot of people are using older systems and have haven't upgraded yet. So think about how long your names get. When you put the document names together with the files in each folder, and each file is in a folder and so on, you can end up with a really long file path. The maximum file path length can be up to 1,024 characters. So be mindful of your file names and your folder names. Some older systems limit the number of levels that you can have in your system. Uh, these are the tiers and the folders for nesting. In the older systems, that limit is eight. So you may not need a folder for every single idea that you have. So think about it this way. Just like when you make an outline, you shouldn't have an A without a B. Uh, it's the same with folders. You may not really need a separate folder if there's only going to be one item in it. Next, use camel case or underscores as an element delimiter. This is what uh, we're really talking about when we're separating out the different elements of your file name so that we can easily see it. You have many elements in your file name, and it'll look like gobbledygook if you don't do something to try to make it readable. Uh, camel case is using a combination of uppercase and lowercase letters, and underscores separate it out and act as a space, but many, many systems don't allow for spaces in, in names. Uh, you can also try a combination of camel case and underscores. As I said before, you should really lead with your date in your file name. State the date back to front using, uh, using the year followed by the month and day. And as I said, be sure to include two digits, two digits for the month and two digits for the day. I'm sorry, I'm sick, I have to cough. I've got to put you on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, so with the month and day, by using two digits for each one, it makes sure that the Januarys end up first and don't end up following the Novembers. Uh, the same with the days. All of those things work according to the computer's natural organizing and searching functions. If you're not going to use a DMS system, it's really important to work with the logic of your computer. Uh, this also maintains chronological of order, even when the file names are listed uh, in the file directory. 
and it makes it easy to find and retrieve the last dated record. Order elements according to your search logic. Uh, this is really a helpful and logical way to work. The decision should be driven by how you use, search for, and retrieve your files in everyday business. Follow the same sequence that you would normally think of searching for a targeted file. Would you start with your client name or with the type of file, the type of document, or with the date? Whatever you're going to use should be the first thing. Elements of a file name should be ordered from general to specific uh, and should lead by the order of importance whenever possible. You want all the letters together, which is general. Then you'll want all of the demand letters together, which is specific. If letter is first and demand is second, then all of the letters will be together and various different types of letters, such as demands or payment confirmations, will be grouped together too. Use leading zeros in numbers in file names. Leading zeros allow for you to scale your, your plan. You don't want to have to go back and renumber things once you get to triple digits, so start early now. Plan for inevitable filing mistakes uh, and issues. So include the client's name in the file name. If the file winds up out of place, you'll still be able to tell what it is and refile it appropriately. It will also facilitate finding it through a search of your system. Having the document type early in the name also helps with this. Plan for multiple versions and implement version control as part of your plan. When there are multiple versions of a document, the version, should not, the version number should appear in the file name so that the most recent version can be easily identified and retrieved. Place the version indicator as the last element in the file name. An element for the version control should start with a V followed by at least two digits. The leading zero is required to ensure that search results are properly sorted. Consider distinguishing between minor and major revisions by using a dash after the version to indicate revision number, such as V2-01. Again, this method facilitates proper sorting, whereas using words in the file name such as final, draft, or review in the file name can affect the order. Consider using a, uh, including a subfolder for drafts so that it's easy to find your final document. And again, lead with a zero so that everything stays in order. If you are using several different types of computers in your firm, uh, it's important to think about cross-platform tips. For many systems, files containing spaces or illegal characters may be replaced with underscores or percent signs, uh, and that can change your file path and may otherwise cause confusion. On a Mac, file names can use any character except a colon, though slashes are often discouraged. In PC files, file names can't begin with a, peri a period or contain slashes, and you shouldn't use other special characters like ampersands. All of these things change how the computers will read your documents, and you definitely don't want some sort of unexpected error. So the conclusion is that you should develop a scheme that you should use. It should be logical. You should be able to look at the file and tell what the logic is so that you or anyone working with you will file it properly and come up with solutions that make sense, even if you didn't address them before. And your tools for success again were, keep the file name short but meaningful, use camel case and underscores and el as element delimiters so that you can read your document names, lead with the date for your file name, order the elements according to search logic, use leading zeros and numbers and file names, and make sure that you plan for inevitable filing mistakes and errors. Things will go wrong, but you should have a backup plan for dealing with it. Excellent, Ivy. Thank you so much for that. So I hope that that answered your question about uh, naming conventions. And if you want more information, we'll also have some more information about Ivy's white paper that she recently wrote on the topic. So let's transition over to must-have tools for a paperless law office. So Dennis has talked about a lot of these in his section. Um, and I did want to point out that uh, Uptime Legal Works is uh, a great system for you know getting your documents into the cloud, um, and they're great folks over there. We um, we really admire the work that they do, and they do it with a lot of integrity. So definitely check them out. Um, something else you might want to think about is where you keep your notes. Um, Evernote is great. I use it religiously all the time, um, but it's a great place to store um, any case research that you might be doing. It's highly searchable um, and it does integrate with Rocket Matter. Um, Hello Fax is another fax alternative. Dennis mentioned uh, two in his section. This is another alternative that you can dig, dig into. You know, we 
we know that the fax machine is still around. Um, if you have clients that use it or if you're in PI, I know a lot of doctor's offices still use it when you need medical records, you'll need to have one. So um, you, you know, you know, look into getting that service that allows you to send and receive faxes via email with no paper, no physical fax machine, and will allow you to take those documents and easily put them into your document management system or your document storage. Um, Adobe Acrobat is definitely critical. You need to spring for a copy of Acrobat Standard or Pro, and that's going to help you turn your documents into digital PDF files and then lets you view and manage them. Um, ScanSnap Scanner, uh, we'll talk about in a second, comes bundled with Acrobat, which is very exciting. Um, and mastering Acrobat is a must for lawyers, um, and a lot of federal courts and local courts require that you upload PDFs to file pleadings. Uh, also remember that metadata is discoverable, so you do want to make sure that you convert any documents to PDF before you send them anywhere outside of your firm. Um, a shredder is also really important. You want to invest in a shredder to securely clear out the reams of paper that you end up scanning into your system and no longer need. Um, it's definitely understandable that you'll need to keep originals of some things, but you know Ivy's philosophy is using less paper, and that less paper mentality will eventually get you closer to being paperless. Um, so that transition phase is really critical, but as you maintain that paperless environment, a shredder is going to be critical to protect any confidential information from, you know, the, the creepy dumpster divers. Um, so we talked about Evernote for digital notes, but there's also Evernote Scannable, and that's that little butterfly icon you see there. Uh, and that allows you to use your mobile device to be able to scan documents into Evernote as well. ScanSnap also has an app that will allow you to uh, scan documents directly to the cloud. Uh, DocuSign is also really great because you can get those digital signatures. You don't have to print out paper to get signatures, um, and they can all be in one place. Uh, and definitely accounting is something that you want to think about, paperless accounting, um, and that can be a lot of paper if you're printing every single thing. Uh, QuickBooks Online is really great. We love cloud-based systems, um, and it does plug into a lot of practice management softwares like Rocket Matter. And then Perfect It. Um, Perfect It will allow you to um, eliminate printing uh, paper during your revision process. Um, Ivy's written uh, the legal style for, for, for Perfect It, so it is legal specific um, and will really help you get the best uh, version of your document out there. So those, those are just a few um, tools that we recommend here. And I do want to show you um, these scanners. You can't have a paperless law office without a scanning process in place. Dennis touched on this as well. So you'll need to scan documents related to current cases, as well as any bills, receipts, and anything that you'd put in a normal file folder when you're thinking about the physical aspect. So you'll need a heavy duty document scanner to do this. ScanSnap is top grade. It comes with a huge bonus, which is that free version of Adobe Acrobat Standard or Pro. Um, and it also lets you scan to your PC, to your Mac, to your iPad or iPhone, any Android device, devices, um, as well as popular cloud storage services for easy access. Um, and uh, it does simplex scan, duplex scan. Uh, you can set it up to go directly to some of these cloud-based services, and it's fairly straightforward and easy. It's basically, you know, something that's lightweight, portable. Um, you just pop it open and you're ready to scan. So I love it. It's great. Um, we did get some questions about a backup system uh, that we may recommend. Um, these are some that um, practice management advisors around the country uh, recommend to uh, attorneys practicing in their state. Um, you really do need to think about this because, you know, it's more likely that your computer will fail um, than it is that you'll be hacked. You do need to think about these things, though, and with all of the ransomware attacks that have happened, um, you know, you don't want to have to pay a huge ransom. If your files are backed up, then you're, you're, you're going to be okay. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to go paperless, but it's another thing to make sure that your business can continue in the event of a disaster. Um, but when you're, all your documents are scanned onto hard drives in your office, that's great. But what if your office burns down or, you know, the hurricane comes and everything floods? You've missed an opportunity to continue operating uninterrupted. 
Um, so we've got these backup storage uh, plans here. So services like Mosey, um, Crash Plan, Carbonite, they can monitor your folder structures and continuously back up your files. Um, and if you want to mostly work with files inside your computer network and you're looking for a passive backup, this might be the easiest way to do things. We do recommend the cloud, but again, this might be something that you can implement. And cloud storage is super cheap these days, so you shouldn't have to look um, you know, too hard to find something that's affordable in your price range. Practice management software. So embracing a cloud practice management software solution such as Rocket Matter, that's essential for law firms to operate efficiently and effectively. And it's gonna help you manage your daily workflows, organize client files, and that will help you achieve a mostly paperless office. So besides the well-known advantages of capturing time, billing, task management, and calendaring, um, some highlights of how practice management software can streamline your firm's operations um, would be, you know, unlimited document storage. Um, that's something that is offered in Rocket Matter. Uh, you can automatically generate, organize, and store and share those documents securely uh, with a client portal, for example. Um, you can share those documents directly with your client. Um, there's no need for printing them, mailing them, or faxing them. So your client would have their own access uh, way to get in there to the documents. Um, and sometimes, uh, especially with our version of it, um, they can access their invoices and any related calendar events you decide to share. So again, no papers involved. Uh, Ivy mentioned document versioning. Rocket Matter allows you to upload multiple documents directly from our Office 365 integration. Um, so you're attaching the billable time and every uh, version of that into Rocket Matter, which is great. Um, Speaking of going paperless, this is where a lot of our clients start the paperless transition, with the billing and invoicing part. So that not only takes a lot of printing, but there are also postage, envelopes, um, the time it takes to stuff them, to delay in receiving payment. So when you share invoices electronically, either through a portal or through email, you should also give your clients the ability to pay securely online with credit card or e-check. So this does support your paperless journey, and it also reduces the time to payment by an average of three weeks. So imagine having the majority of your invoices paid within the first seven days of sending them. This is the kind of opportunity that you're opening yourself up to in addition to reducing the cost and time it takes um, to get this process done. You do want to think about um, a provider of these services that knows um, how to manage trust accounts um, so that you don't get into any sort of trouble with your bar association. So our payment processing LexCharge has experience in that and you know they pull the funds uh, from the operating account for any fees, um, but any appropriate funds that need to go into trust will go there directly. So Ivy, I do want to give you the opportunity to tell us about some of these additional resources that you're offering our attendees today. Thanks, Nefra. So part of going paperless, as Nefra has said, is that you actually simply have to start by using less paper. Most lawyers now, when they are writing something, they print out a document, they read it, they mark it on paper, and then they go back to their computer and they try to hand enter those edits. And then they do this process again and again and again, printing a document six, seven, eight times. There are still errors, it's still not correct, and you've wasted all of that paper. Think about a document that's 40 pages long and you've printed it seven or eight times. What a waste. So if you increase the effectiveness of your on-screen review uh, by using Perfectit, then you can reduce those printing rounds. I'd still say print it out once and read it over because it's hard to see everything on your screen, uh, but we can do that for you. So there's an article on that uh, available at Intelligent Editing. Uh, it's intelligentediting.com slash paperless. And then I've also written uh, my naming conventions white paper, which covers in detail a lot of the things that I just discussed in the 15 minutes that I had. The white paper guides you through making your own naming conventions policy and implementing the plan. That's available to download at intelligentediting.com uh, slash <clears throat> naming conventions. I apologize, I'm still struggling with illness. Oh, no. uh, so. Sorry about that. Uh, so these resources are available to you. They're free, they're on the Intelligent Editing website. Uh, and we really do believe that using less paper is a great way to get started. 
Excellent. Thank you, Ivy. Um, and someone asked if um, this would have a few example of suggested naming conventions. Does the white paper have a few of those in there? Yes, the white paper has examples uh, of policies and naming conventions. Excellent. All right, and Dennis, can you tell us about some of the additional resources that Uptime is going to be offering? Absolutely. I would definitely recommend everybody check out the white paper from Ivy. It sounds great. Uh, we also have some great resources on our site, which you can check out at uptimelegalworks.com and click on the resources link. Lots of great resources uh, ranging from a checklist um, on how to go paperless, kind of some of the steps and things we talked about, but fleshed out in a little more detail that you can use as sort of your paperless plan, uh, as well as a document management software comparison chart that really kind of does a side-by-side -side comparison of the leading document management systems to help you go paperless, uh, as well as a case study uh, of a law firm that we work pretty closely with, what life was like before they made the switch to, it, in this case, our document management system, what life was like after, and lots of other great resources that I definitely encourage everybody to go and check out. Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. And Rocket Matter does have a paperless law office ebook. We put out our second edition this year. If you go to rocketmatter.com and click on resources, we've got a lot of ebooks and white papers there on tons of topics related to law firm management, uh, including going paperless. So that's a great resource. Um, so Ivy and Perfected have been so generous and uh, are offering a one-year license of Perfected to an attendee today. Um, and that winner is Jim Gumbert. So Jim, thank you for attending today. You've got a free year of Perfected. Um, and we will get your information from you after this webinar is over. And our partners at Fujitsu have also donated an IX500 for uh, one of our attendees today. Um, and that winner is Michael Vogler. So Michael, um, we'll be reaching out to you to get your information and you'll be receiving a scanner courtesy of Fujitsu. Rocket Matters offering a special this month for any new subscribers. So if you sign up in the month of December, you'll get a free additional user for one year. So to check that out, give us a call at the number below, 888-432-1529, and a member of our award-winning um, account executive team would be happy to help you. So let's jump into some questions in the few minutes that we have left here. Folks, if we don't get to your question, we'll do our best to uh, get you um, the answers um, in a few minutes. All right, uh, I think Dennis can probably handle this one. Uh, what's a good backup strategy? What's a good backup strategy? Um, the best backup strategy is to, uh, in my view, is to be in the cloud in the first place because by moving to the cloud, you're outsourcing essentially all aspects of your technology uh, to this provider, right? From security to availability, meaning not going down, to backups, right? So the best way to, to do backups is to not do backups. Um, get a cloud uh, solution, whether it be a private cloud or, or a cloud-based solution like Rocket Matter or like LegalWorks, so that that company is managing the backups for you. Okay, Because um, they're, they're likely, you know, in all candor, better suited in, in the business of doing that. And we have redundant servers all over the place. So, you know, it's not just in Absolutely. one location, it's multiple backups and it's happening every night. So, um, so exactly. how do you decide which documents you need to keep the original of? Ivy, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, original documents are necessary for certain types of things that you write. For instance, wills and trusts. Uh, most of those documents need to be an original wet signature. A lot of bank documents, or at least they used to require an original wet signature on file. Uh, it all really depends on your state bar and what they require for a document to be legally enforceable. Uh, most state bar associations do address this uh, pretty clearly in their Q&A sections. 
Okay. All right. This is the last question we're going to take because we are at the two o'clock hour. Uh, and I wonder if Dennis or Ivy, you guys have a creative solution for this. So our local courthouse does not offer Wi-Fi. So we're wondering how to manage a paperless law office as the attorneys do not want to look at documents on small devices such as phones or iPad. Do we have a choice other than to continue to maintain the paper file? It's a good question. I can throw my, my two cents in there, and, and Ivy, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, Two-part solution. Uh, one option may be to essentially, with a, with a laptop, for instance, to tether it to your phone or use a wireless hotspot, really, and that gives you the ability to have internet access and therefore access to your cloud platform, whatever it is, wherever you go, and you're no longer beholden on the venue you're at uh, to, to have that wireless. Um, Add to that, if or if that's just simply not practical or feasible for one way, reason or another, um, good document management systems, in our view, like our own Uptime League Works, have a sync and take offline function with them. So you can sync a matter, the whole database, an individual file to, say, your laptop and take it with you. And then when you get back to the office and have that internet connectivity restored, everything syncs up. So those would be uh, two different approaches I would suggest. I basically would give the same advice as Dennis, uh, except that I would also add that Evernote is a really good way to deal with that. I I use Evernote for pretty much everything and it's a really easy way to, if the judge asks you a question about a case that you cited and maybe you didn't bring your stack of cases with you, uh, you can pull up the case using some sort of key thing like a blue sweater was part of the case and uh, and you can use Evernote to pull that up on your phone um, or any other document uh, and you can use it offline. Yeah, I love Evernote. Highly, highly searchable. It's great. All right, folks. So that's all the time we have for today. If you want to contact any of us, here are our email addresses. You can get Ivy at Ivy at IntelligentEditing.com, Dennis at Dennis.Dimka at UptimeLegal.com, and you can reach me at Nefra at RocketMatter.com. We appreciate you all attending today. The recording and the slides will be sent tomorrow, along with a discount code um, for Perfect It for a year, um, as well as as a discount code to get $50 off of your Fujitsu scan snap. So if you registered or attended, you will receive those codes in your inbox tomorrow at noon Eastern. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ivy and Dennis. Thank you. Have a great day.